I, did, I wasn't just changing my job. I, I was ending my life. And, right. and, you know, so not only did you, did I accomplish, you know, the impossible by, by making it in rock and roll, I then walked away from it. Mm -hmm. so, so it was like, uh, totally insane, you know, just totally untethered in, in, in every sense of the word. And I didn't have any plan B, you know, there was uh, just staring into the abyss at that point. Tokyo tonight. gang what's going on man you know a little dystopia that's about it <laughs> <laughs> that's what we like to hear especially around the holidays <laughs> oh my god i uh dude i i loved your book seriously thank you so much for sending it uh to me i liked reading it one of the things i loved about it is the uh it's just the sheer optimism in the book man because you go through a lot of highs you go through a lot of lows but throughout the entire thing all the way towards the end is your optimism and your just belief in um, just rock and roll, being able to kind of handle anything. Uh, where did that start and where did it come from? Were you, were you always like that? Or was the opt, did it take time to build that kind of optimism? Yeah, well, it's, it's a, you know, it's an optimism, but a cautionary tale at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know, no, it's not, it's not all, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not all, it's not all, uh, highs um i i don't know I, I, i've been trying to analyze this myself because uh you know it's come up in several interviews um how i was able to just handle whatever was thrown at me in life and um i don't know all i can say is i, I got it you know the only the only analysis i could come up with was when i was young uh you know my my mother um divorced my father uh, and i don't know i was about two or three mm -hmm. And that's supposed to be, you know, traumatic and 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 make you more insecure. Um, but we moved in with her parents, you know. So um, now I, I'm 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 Italian blood, so I'm the first Italian grandchild, right? Which is, you know, something like you know, on the order of divinity in an in an Italian family. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and, and so I got the, I got the grandparents there. I got aunts and uncles, and you know. So until my mother remarried when I was like seven and we moved to Jersey and I got a Dutch name, even though I'm Italian, um, <laughs> you know, I just got a lot of love, man. Is all I can, is all I can think, you know, that's the only thing I can come up with, man. Yeah. I, I really, you know, cause, um, it's never been smooth sailing exactly. You know what I mean? Uh, it's always been a struggle. Right. Um, but you know, you just kind of deal with it. And I, I never was a really a whiner or a complainer or, you know what I mean? You just kind of deal with it, man, and move on. Yeah. You know? Um, you know, so I don't know. I, I think it, it probably, you know, it, it comes from that. I, I think, it, you know, those first couple of years of your life, I think are, are quite significant, you know, uh, the circumstance that you find yourself in or, you know, the, the environment, you know, I guess it's a little bit of DNA also, but, um, yeah, you know, but I, uh, that's all I can come up with, man. I, I, I don't know. There's no, there's no real, you know, there's no other than, other than just what's the use of complaining, you, you know, you, you might as well just like you know right deal with it you know no i know what you mean man it's it's kind of crazy too because we've had a bunch of conversations on on this show just with people talking about resiliency and what makes you resilient and it's kind of people find it hard to pinpoint but it does come from like you said like a lot of love a lot of family like you know kind of just plowing ahead and moving forward and uh and that's you know that's definitely one of the things i took out of, out of your book dude because you seem to be resilient no matter what's going on you know you have uh um you know, a positive attitude. Like, yeah, it, positive it's attitude. Only, yeah, luck yeah. favors the positive, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. But, but uh, no, no, I, I'm part of the luckiest generation ever that ever will ever live, and uh, I'm you know the luckiest guy in the luckiest generation. So right. you know, yeah. there is that too. Do you think that's a combination of what made you like to take risks? Um, because you, you said something in the book that I love where you said, occasionally you need to be untethered. 
And I think that's when you were talking about, you know, leaving the E Street Band and whatever. But d is that what your where it comes from? You wanting to take risks like that? Yeah. Well, I mean, just making it in, in rock and roll was such a long shot, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is like kind of the first half of the book. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, local Jersey kid makes it to the top of rock right. and roll, which is a yeah. good story in itself, you know, and I don't, I don't mean mm -hmm. to take it for granted. Um, but it's, um, you know, the, I think just just having made it in the most, imp you know, the most impossible dream coming true uh, uh, probably set up the rest of, of what happens in the second half of the book, you know. Sure. When I, yeah. when I leave the band and. At the second half, uh, you know, all of a sudden, I, I you know, I, did, I wasn't just changing my job. I, I was ending my life. And, right. and, you know, so not only did you did I accomplish, you know, the impossible by, by making it in rock and roll, I then walked away from it. Mm -hmm. so, so it was like uh, totally insane, you know, just totally untethered in, in, in every sense of the word. And I didn't have any plan B. You know, there was uh, just staring into the abyss at that point. Right. So, um, so, so now things start to, you know, you know, I don't, I don't know whether you look at it as destiny or, or whether we look at it as uh, uh, whatever, but, 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 you know, slowly, um, I think this is where the book becomes more useful to people mm -hmm. because uh, I think everybody, maybe at some point in their life hits the wall, gets a little, you know, gets, gets a disappointment, maybe a major disappointment, maybe, you know, their original plan doesn't work out. Right. And, you know, uh, I think the usefulness of the book is suggesting that if you can find a way to move forward, no matter how depressed you are, you know, and, and if you can, you know, avoid the obvious, you know, drinking and drugging and suicide. Right. You know, all of which I consider the, the major three, you know, yeah, <laughs> the three basics, you know, uh, if, you, if you can get, you know, if you can move forward without without succumbing to that, you know, coming to that depression. Um, destiny will surprise you, you know, and it turns out everything I've accomplished in my life mm -hmm. happened after I thought my life was over. Yeah. Wow. You know what I mean? So, so which, which is kind of, uh, uh, bizarre, you know, and, um, and I think, you know, I think people, if they, you know, if they, if they, if they follow the book that far, you know, into the, in, into the end of the book, you know, you get a sense of like, um, be ready, you know, be ready for what destiny hands you, man, because you, yeah. you don't know what's going to be. I think that is an interesting take. And people need to hear that kind of stuff because everybody's gone through something traumatic in their lives or they've yeah. gone. Everybody's had that dark place that they've been to or, or something going on. But it is funny when you look back and you go, holy shit, if I had done something horrible or, or really succumbed to it, you know, I would have never done all of this shit. That's led to you know whatever good right. or bad, and, and you know and, and look and the nice thing about about writing the book because I, I never look back you know mm -hmm. so I had to really transport myself back sure. and really you know relive my life so I kind of had this feeling in my head you know for forty years mm -hmm. that uh, geez I wish I could have stayed in the band and still done all of the things I did right you know? and then when you go back and and you really relive it you realize that. Yeah, ridiculous. It, it's you know, there's no way that that would have happened. You know, um, you just you wouldn't have done the seven solo albums and become an artist. You know, sure. you wouldn't have done Sopranos. You wouldn't have done Lily Hammer. You wouldn't have done Sun City. Mandela might still be in jail. You know, <laughs> right. you know. Right. I mean, you know, and and, and you look back and, and and I thought I really thought that I was fucking with destiny when I left the band. You know. Mm -hmm. And now I, I really think I was fulfilling destiny by leaving the band, you Absolutely. know, uh, and that was a big, big turnaround from my head. You know what I mean? Because right. I've been kind of like for, for literally decades, you know, it kind of always bothered me. You know, I was like, yeah. Man, you know, I really felt like I did the wrong thing, you know, and I, and I wish I hadn't done that. And I wish I could have done everything, you know, at once, you know, but, but, you know, you go back and, you know. You can't you can't go to Bruce Springsteen and say, "Listen, man, you know, do you mind taking six months off while I go and try and be an actor?" <laughs> right. You know, right. I'm not sure, I'm not sure I am an actor or I can be an actor, but I want to go give it a try. You know right. what I mean? Fine, you know, like put the band on a hiatus for six months. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, that's just not going to happen. Right. And, and uh, so, you know, you look back now. You know, I look back very differently than than. Uh, so that was that was a good that was a good thing I learned I learned by by writing the book.
That's that, uh, that's all. What, what was the thing that made you want to write it in the first place? Because as somebody who likes to just kind of not look back and plow yeah. forward, what was the point where you're I, like, I, I got to jot I, it down? I think, the, you know, the opportunity of the quarantine was part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The fact that I had the most productive three years of my entire life right before the quarantine, 2017, mm -hmm. 18, 19, I did two new albums, you know, Soul Fire and Summer of Sorcery, and, and put out six album packages. You know, right. my entire wow. catalog... The, the Lily Hammer score, you know, um, uh, both live albums of the live tours, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that helped give me some closure because I wouldn't, I never had planned on going back into the music business at all. You know, right. that was yeah. by a bizarre circumstance that I got back into it. Uh, so that, that helped. Uh, the quarantine naturally helped. I got new managers for the first time, you know, only 40 years too late. <laughs> and, uh, and, and and they encouraged me to do it and um and and i just felt you know i thought you know what um if i can make the book useful then it might be worth doing and so i i, I got a fantastic editor uh ben greenman and i said to him listen man uh, i want to balance three things here because you know one of which of course is going to be the narrative which is the least interesting part to me mm -hmm. But in, in addition to the narrative, I want to I want to talk about history because I, I witnessed everything except the first decade of rock and roll. Okay? Right. So I want to kind of share my observations about the history just so people, you know, uh, can, you know, the younger younger people, if they read the book by some chance, will realize, you know, this stuff doesn't fall off trees, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the other th third, I wanted to, to really discuss my the crafts that I've been involved in because. Um, you know, I've been seriously, significantly involved in over a dozen crafts, and uh, and um, you know, just just share my observations about that. Maybe it'll you know be helpful to somebody. So, between those three things, you know, the history, the narrative, and the crafts, you know, I thought you know, in the end, like I said, I think I think I could be useful. The book could be useful. It's it's interesting that you say that too, because in one of the chapters you talk about the seventies. And how, uh, which I didn't even realize at the time, but you, you're dead on accurate about the engineers kind of having control of 70s music and the way it sounded. Never thought of it that way before. Was that something you noticed at the time or did you have to go back and look at the catalog and, and figure that out? Well, it, um, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure we would have recognized it precisely that way mm -hmm. um, because that was our first time in the studio. You know, right. so uh, it was kind of, you know, I, I knew it was something was wrong, you know, okay. because it just sucked, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I'm growing up with all these great records. Right. And um, you expect it to sound like that, <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you know, <laughs> uh, you know and, and uh, I mean, they literally, the concept was... <laughs> Take the excitement out of the recording so that we could put it back in in the mix. <laughs> God, you know, so they could have like this psychotic control of every, <laughs> every electron, you know? Right. You know? And uh, so I, I, you know, it took me a minute to figure it out, um, which I did. Uh, you know, I, I, I kept saying, like, why does every, every record I have, why do the drums sound so great? Right. And why do they suck what I'm listening to right now? You know? <laughs> why does it sound like somebody's hitting a fucking pillow, you know, with a baseball bat? You know? Right. What what happened here? You know, and I and I and I just studied it and studied it and, and asked questions of older people and figured out that it was a couple of things. You know, it was it was the room sound, which which mm. you know had they'd stopped using because, you know, God forbid there was leakage of two instruments, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, right. and 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 the tuning uh, well three things uh the room sounds the tuning of the drums which had become a lost craft because uh, rock drummers stopped taking lessons from jazz guys mm -hmm. uh, which the entire first two generations of rock and roll you know were all jazz guys you know right no yeah rock and roll, you know there's no yeah. such thing yet so the the way the drums are tuned is is, is one is another thing and then the way the drums are hit Mm -hmm. You know, rock drummers think, you know, the harder you hit the drum, the bigger it's going to sound, which is exactly the opposite. Right. You know, yeah. in fact, if it's tuned right and the room sound in the room and the mic is right in the, in the right place, you know, the easier you hit that snare, the bigger it's going to sound. 
You right. Know? Yeah. So, you know, those three things. And I figured it out. We figured it out. And I, I finally was able to apply it uh, during the river, which was, you know, five yes. albums in, man. You know, was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm never I'm never not going to be able to hear it like that now, by the way. Thanks to you. So anytime I <laughs> listen to 70s, yeah. like, and you then, know. And the, and the only exception was 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 Bonham with, with Led Zeppelin. You know, you'll, you'll, right. you'll hear his drums and, and they sound different. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, they were very, very, they were very hip. I mean, Jimmy Page is a genius producer. I don't know why he didn't do more, right. but uh, you know, I mean, that first album was you know two or three weeks. I mean, give me a break. You know, yeah. every time you listen to that first Led Zeppelin album, it gets better. I mean, it's beyond belief. Right. But 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 all of the records, you know, they were they were recording in stairwells, and you know, they were using room sound, and and they were mm. just hip, hip enough to do that. Did you guys get to like when you got when you got to know them and and whatever? Did you guys get to talk about that kind of stuff at the time, or was it just not on well, your mind? I've never really, you know, I I've met Jimmy a few times, but just never really had a conversation with him, you know. Mm. Uh, which uh, I hope to do someday, but um, it's never been in the right circumstance, you know. Yeah, I ran into him backstage with when I went to see Jeff Beck last 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 whatever that was oh, a couple nice. years ago now. You know, it's nice to see Jimmy observing Jeff Beck. You know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And feeling the same way that I do, you know what I mean? Like right. he, he's just as big a fan as I am, and oh, uh, awesome. you know they, they go way back. They go back to like, uh, you know, even even maybe further than me and Bruce. They they were uh, right. They were also teenage friends, you know. And uh, Jimmy was offered the Yardbirds gig first, mm -hmm. and, and he says, uh, you know, I'm making too much money as a session guy. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, um, you know, go 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 talk to my friend Jeff Beck. You know, yeah. It was cool. I like in, in the book when you talk about meeting uh, meeting Bruce in your teenage years or whatever. Basically, you said that you know if you were in a band, you had long hair, you know whatever. You were instantly friends because you you felt like misfits. Does that feeling ever go away? Do you guys ever kind of talk about that? Like, do you still have that in you? Well, oddly enough, rock and roll, you know, became a, a legitimate business. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, who could have figured that? Uh, <laughs> When we did it, you know what I mean, in the 60s, it was not, you know, right. it, it didn't really become a business at all until the 70s, mm -hmm. um, you know, but once it became a legitimate business, I mean, the, the, the turning point for me with my with my parents was Bruce getting on the cover of Time and Newsweek, you know, right. which was, uh, uh, in, you know, ridiculous, uh, you know, right. just, just, it was, it's just mm -hmm. uh, impossible. <laughs> and, uh, you know, suddenly my father was like, uh, wait a minute, you know, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe this kid's on to something yeah. uh, as opposed to being on something. Right. Uh, but I don't know. So, so, but, but yeah, I think to answer your question, I, I think, I think you're right. I think it does stay with you forever. You know, mm -hmm. that feeling of being a, a bit of a freak and an outsider and <laughs> A misfit and an outcast, right? <laughs> um, you know, I think so. I think so. Yeah, I think I, I'm glad to hear that because I feel like that's what keeps you kind of creative and making the same kind of music and stuff like that. Is that that's that weird, awkward, you know, or or you know, outcasty kind of vibe that you had keeps you kind of out of Hollywood, you know, separate a little bit. Yeah, and and grown up in in that Renaissance period, I think was right. also a factor because you know your standards got set so high. Yeah. You yeah. know, every Did you, single month was something phenomenal, you know? Yeah. And, you know, and, and and you just kind of took it for granted at the time. And then did you, it, you know, did you know you guys had a different sound then? Because, like, when you guys, all the guys that you came up with, and, you know, I mean, in the, in the 70s especially or whatever, but, you know, like, there is, there's, there's you know, Led Zeppelin and Fleetwood Mac and on, you know, um, uh, Jay Souther and all those other guys or whatever. Like, but you guys had a distinctly different kind of rock sound than anybody else did did it did you notice that did you notice the crowds noticing that well it was, it was a bit of an evolution um you know we were all evolving separately um and together you know in, in other words coming from the same roots but um you know like once bruce bruce is doing his first two records which were very odd and eclectic mm -hmm. um i'm not even sure you could categorize them really you know um, you know, and then a, a, he made a huge, huge uh, evolutionary move with his third album, Born to Run. Mm -hmm. But right at the same time, me and Southside Johnny, you know, I'm, 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 I'm with the Jukes at that time. 
and yeah. we were revolutionizing the entire bar band sound and and didn't know right. it we didn't know right it. you know we just felt we needed to do something original because we were coming from that renaissance period when you had to be original mm -hmm. but then even in the 70s when it became fragmented and became you know um no longer a, a monoculture even the hybrids had to have some kind of originality you know mm -hmm. uh the you know aerosmith was you know they were known as a combination of the stones and yardbirds you know what i mean right uh, you know the day of the original total originality <laughs> was over so now you now you were a combination of something you know right yeah. and with the jukes we ended up being was a combination of rock and soul you know right. which which you know we weren't quite conscious of being you know how original we actually were but we just you know me and Southside and, and bruce uh went to see sam and dave and uh and they just blew our minds. I mean, they just were unbelievable uh, in a club. And so we decided, me and Johnny, were going to be, you know, the white Sam and Dave. So I was already a rock guitar player. And we just added the horns. And so suddenly we got this rock and soul thing going on, you know. Nice. Uh, you know, just very organically, very naturally. Um, the evolution of the E Street sound, um, I don't know. I, it kind of stayed eclectic to some, to some, to some degree. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, by Born to Run, uh, featuring that organ and piano, uh, both, mm -hmm. only, really only two other groups. Um, well, you know, the band was doing it. Procol Harum was doing it. Uh, and Mitch Ryder actually was doing it in the Detroit Wheels, but only on record. I right. saw Mitch Ryder, and he, he never had two keyboards live for some stupid reason. Wow, that's weird. And they were both important on his records, you know? Yeah. Um, so that so that piano and organ combination made a statement, which meant you were now coming from the gospel church. That, that's what that means, you know? Mm -hmm. That that was yeah. a direct line from gospel. Um, and then having the saxophone, of course, made a huge statement in the 70s, right. long after it was no longer fashionable. There was a statement about tradition, you know, um, you know, you're going to keep one sort of foot back in tradition as we move forward um, to carry that tradition forward into some new some new hybrid, some new interesting combination of things. So. Um, um, it ends up, a, a, you know, it ends up a bunch of different uh, different characteristics that um, I don't know. It, I, I, he didn't really, as I talk about in the book, and I, and I didn't intend to, for Bruce to be in the book as much as he ended up being in it, actually, because right. as, I, as, as I went through the as I went through the you know the the years and the, the albums, I had never analyzed what had happened with him. And uh, I really got a chance to analyze it, you know, the darkness on the edge of town thing, which was uh, the, his, the biggest evolution, really. Right. Uh, uh, you know, and I, at the time, I was completely, uh, you know, that was kind of John Landau's, um, you know, area, you know, that they would have these discussions about the lyrics and, and the concepts and the, and the themes. All I wanted to do was make great records, you know, and, uh, and I was extremely, you know, uh, frustrated at that point sure. uh, during the darkness years which is just you know the worst you know the the, the best material with the worst sound uh, i thought right and, um, so i wouldn't i wouldn't really be happy and relax until the river you know that's when they they made me one of the producers and i was like you know we're gonna make an album that sounds great you know yeah, uh, yeah. you know um but i didn't so i never analyzed what was going on mm -hmm. you know and, and when i went back i said wow you know Born and Run was a huge evolution, mm -hmm. okay, but it was really transitional. You know, it was it was kind of a, a first breakthrough. Um, it got it got attention. It got it got much more attention than, than obviously the first two his first two albums, but it wasn't as big a success as people thought. You know, wow. but 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 it was sort of um, giving him an identity that was yep. uh, functional. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 well liked mm -hmm. and once you have that breakthrough in in any business but but certainly in show business once you have found your identity that that other people are now relating to you usually stick with it but but bruce did did, did not you know he, he like he said okay here's this very interesting character this guy on board to run 
mm-hmm. and with all yeah. those themes and it's kind of urban and kind of the Jersey kid looking across at the New York City and you know there's a whole kind of a an urban uh, mythology going on there you know right yeah and and he just he and and he just gets the, the darkness on the edge of town and decides uh, you know guess what folks I, I I you know I've asked you to fall in love with this guy this mm-hmm. born to run guy but that's not me right that's me you know and i'm now about to completely change my identity <laughs> <laughs> even though i just finally broke through you know after yeah. 20 fucking years you know right you know of, of, of work and and i didn't you know i, I just I, I didn't really analyze it till till i till i wrote the book i mean till you know six months ago i was like mm. holy shit you know, because they go, they go, in, they go into the studio and talk for hours, hours. Man. You know, and uh, and you know, we were just, you know, getting high. You know, we were just, uh, <laughs> we were, we were just like, you know, just kind of, you know, whatever. But 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 uh, but it turns out that you know he he would completely transform uh, from the guy. You know, it's a town full of losers. I'm. I'm breaking out of here to win, whatever the line is, uh, right. it, you yeah. know, in Borden, in Thunder Road, uh, he would turn around and completely to, uh, I'm staying. Yeah. I'm staying in this town. Okay. You know, I'm going to be part of this town and I'm not going to have a, it's not a war with my father anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to, I understand my father now, you know, yeah. and yeah. I'm going to kind of represent my father and I'm going to, you know, and, and it was like a complete turnaround from, you know, Running to staying and fighting uh, yep. from uh, urban to rural, right? Um, yep. You know, and he stayed that way, and 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 and, and that and that and then he, that's when he found himself, and and he stayed, and he's been that ever since. You know, right? Uh, um, you know, so it was a, you know, that evolution. Now, now, you know, sound wise, um, you know, I mean, he's made up of a lot of different people he, through the years. You know. Mm-hmm. As far as his yeah. singing goes, his singing style, you know, made up of a lot of different guys from John Finley to Van Morrison to et cetera, et cetera. You know, sure. Paul, you know Paul, Paul Jones, uh, you know. Uh, um, but musically, um, it would be just a, a kind of an eclectic group of, you know, Roy Bitten would be more um, a Broadway type of piano player, which I didn't get at first. Okay. Know? Yeah. I, like, I was like, I don't, I don't. I don't think I like this. This is not right. rock and roll, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, and and, and uh, but then I slowly realized, you know, that Bruce Bruce does not want to do a straight ahead rock and roll thing. You know, he he, right. he wants to he wants to be more theatrical. You know, mm-hmm. he has yeah. a theatrical element. You know, so that was that was what Roy brought. You know, and Gary, you know, coming from tradition or like rockabilly and. Uh, you know, of course, Clarence representing soul and R and B, yeah. and I was I don't know what you know, um, <laughs> uh, you know, just rhythm guitar. You know, Keith Richards, uh, Pete Townsend, you yeah. know, John Lennon. You know, yeah. I don't know. You know, so <laughs> so I think the combi- it was just an interesting combination, and uh, and it became it became uh, its own magic, its yeah. own thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, I feel like you are like the epitome out of the entire band of rock and roll. We've actually had people asking questions. They're like, where do you get your clothes? Do you decide your own styling? Do you do yeah, that yeah. yourself? Because <laughs> you feel rock and roll. You see, are they all custom you made? <laughs> would, you, would you pay a stylist to look like me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> They'd be arrested. <laughs> They'd be arrested for false advertising. <laughs> No, I do not have a stylist. God forbid. Oh. I just, I don't know. I just, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, um, you like what you like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm kind of like every day, you know, 1967 to me. You know, I right. never really, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I never really left. You know, I, I'm not nostalgic about the 60s. I never left. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, and. Uh, you know, I had the car accident. You know, and so it started wearing bandanas and. Uh, you know, and uh, that just became my thing, yeah. you know. And and then when you transformed into, like, the acting world, there's so many people that don't even recognize you from, from this incredible achievement on the musical end. And then you and move into being on one of the most iconic TV shows ever. And 
Yeah, that's the idea. You know, that's what that's what that's where the bandana really came in handy. You know, yeah. <laughs> now you know I don't want to be recognized. You know, you don't want to be recognized. You don't, right. you don't want to carry that baggage. You know, you want people to yeah. believing. You know, you, you, they got to suspend their disbelief. You know, they got to they got to believe that character, and uh, that's why I'm very lucky. Again, you you know, you're lucky if a, if an audience defines you once. Right. You know, yeah. you really. You know, but to, have, to be totally accepted as an actor was a, was a real gift, and uh, you know, very few very few of us uh, m m make that trip. Yeah. So um, you know, I was very I was very lucky, but but I think that's one reason why because I look so different that mm. you know you're able to you're able mm. to just um, see see the see the character. You know. Yeah. yeah. But you uh, totally crushed. I feel like throughout that, throughout the Sopranos whole series, and then Lily Hammer was one of my favorites. I was, I was, I had just gone to Norway when I really binge watched that show, and I was like, wow. "This is incredible." <laughs> yeah, I'm very proud of that one. That was, uh, that was tricky. That was tough to pull off. And uh, very, you know, we only did 24 shows, but I'm very proud of them. I, I, you know, I got a chance to turn my one new craft into five. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. I ended up. Uh, Co-writing, co-producing, and did you know, all the music, and and I even directed the final episode, which was which was fun. Amazing, right. you know. Yeah, we had uh, um, we had your brother on the show, and he was saying when he was younger, he used to put on shows all the time. Were you a part? Did you like that kind of stuff? Because it's funny that you did the rock and roll thing for a while, and then kind of crossed over into the acting realm. Was he kind of like, "Come on, man, <laughs> <laughs> what, the, what? what the fuck"? <laughs> <laughs> my, my brother was on this show. Yeah, yes. yeah, he was on the show. Oh, wow, that's great. Yeah, well, with with his book, huh? Yeah, you know with his, his book. Yeah, with his book. Yeah, yeah, terrific, the terrific book. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that that book was great. Um, uh, well, yeah, yeah, getting on, wandering into my turf. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think uh, it caught everybody by surprise. Right. Uh, it was the same, you know, same thing, same thing with my wife, who's you know uh, another. You know, legitimate actor. She yeah, yeah. She went to school for years, and uh, so it was weird that I ended up, uh, yeah, getting the gig. But uh, was it know. on your mind at the time? Like, was it something that like, or did it just spring up? No, no. I, I never, never had any interest in being an actor. Because uh, you're uh, great, by the way. I mean, I know you said modestly uh, before that you were like, I don't even know if I am, but but I mean, you're phenomenal. Thank you. No, thank you. I, I think I think those kind of things. A new craft like that kind of it helps when you you've had a little life experience. I think you know. I mean, that was sure. you know a gift that came to me in my forties. You know, so by then, mm -hmm. you know, you got a kind of a a good sense of life, and I think you're able to bring that bring yeah. that to the to the to the to the craft. You know, um, but I didn't know. I, I I thought maybe I'd someday I'd write and maybe even direct. Uh, you know, TV or film. Mm -hmm. But uh, I never, it never, it never occurred to me to be an actor, and, and uh, I never would have considered it if, yeah. if they hadn't called. Does it? Do you have kind of like uh, uh, because again, like obviously you're already very successful with music and stuff like that, and then you went into the acting thing. Does it? Uh, did it intimidate you at the time going into a different kind of art form, or because you were already so successful, you were like, meh. You know what I mean? Like, because well, I think comedians do that kind of thing where it's shitty, where we're like, well, if I suck at acting, I can always go back to telling dick jokes, which is what we yeah, do. Yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh. there is that to some extent. Yeah, you, you kind of like, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You right. Know. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, yeah, I, I, can, I, I can make a living. Um, um, I, I, I think part of it was I, I wrote a biography of the guy, you know, and. Um, right. And part of that was that he was fearless. Um, sure. So I knew if I could see the guy in the mirror, that I could be him. Cool. And so I had to create my guy from the outside in. And at the same time, uh, like I said, I wrote a whole biography. Uh, you know, him mm -hmm. and Jimmy were close, and you know, him and Tony Soprano were, were close, right? Uh, and all that. So um, you know, when I came out of that trailer, I, I was that guy, right? You know, you so were I, Silvio. Yeah. yeah, and he wasn't going to be intimidated by anything. Right. Was it hard to shake off that character sometimes when you had to go do other things? Um, it was it was frustrating not being that character when I got into business meetings. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wish I was that guy. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. 
No, no, uh, no. I, I'm not a method guy. I, I'm not really. Uh, I, I can leave it. You know, I leave it there. You know. Yeah. I, I need to ask you, with the final episode, there was so much uproar about the final episode. Where do you think it went? Because everybody's always giving their opinions on what happened in that final scene. And it's probably the most iconic final scene. You're back to Sopranos now, I take it. Fr yeah, from the mind <laughs> of Silvio Dante. Because you said you were that guy. What happened? Yeah, yeah. well, I, I, we did a, there was an article in Vanity Fair, you know, uh, a couple of years after the show ended in the, uh, I think I think the article ended with with that same question to me, and I say I say now as as, as I said it then I said you know I said to the reporter I said okay I'm going to tell you the definitive answer okay I know a lot of people are talking about this I said, I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to give you the uh, the ultimate you know the ultimate uh, truth so he he came in real close uh, okay. <laughs> said, okay okay what happened I said. The director yelled, cut, and he <laughs> went home. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Did a lot of that influence your style when you finally got a chance to do some of the writing and producing on, like when you moved over oh, to totally, Louisiana? Totally, totally. It was the greatest school in the world, the Sopranos. Yeah. David Chase and those guys, greatest writers, greatest actors, Jimmy, you know, and, and, and Edie and Michael and... And, you know, Vinny and, and Tony, and, you know, and all those guys. I mean, uh, it was just the greatest school you could possibly go to for for everything, for acting, for writing, for producing, for directing. You know, I learned, you know, uh, you know, just I was keeping my eyes open and uh, paying attention, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and that was the one that was my one regret about, you know, going back to the band, because I, I think if I hadn't. I would have ended up writing and, and maybe directing uh, Sopranos. Still time, you know. They're, they're doing the new. Didn't they do? Aren't they doing the new well, one? The, you know what's funny? We had a, a fan ask that the Many Saints of Newark. They said the character that played the young version of you did not do your character justice. Like you created all of these oh. incredible mannerisms and like I you thought, were. I thought he was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. I disagree. I disagree. I thought he had the mannerisms. I thought he was good. You think he, he nailed it? All yeah, right. yeah, yeah, definitely. Can't get a bigger thumbs up than that, right? No, no I thought he was great. Really, there yeah. you go, Richie. That, that's that our random fan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had another question from somebody um, who was asking about. I don't know if you're you're up to speed on what's going on with the barn, but the uh, Asbury Park Press had. Um, Something about Tinker's Garage going on. There's like a renovation going on in the area. Do you have any feeling about that? If they're taking it down, or do you know any? Um, I don't know. Memories? What, I don't know what what that is. What's the barn? The uh, it's Tinker's Garage. I think they do, they did some. They said they did, you did some recordings down there or something like the that. Old, or... the, old, the old surfboard factory. Yeah. Oh. Well, uh, I think we got our answer. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I don't, I, don't, I don't have any feelings about it. No. I didn't have any feeling. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I do regret uh, the fact that we 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 should have found a way to to buy upstage and save that though. That was that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Yeah, you know, it just sat there for twenty years, right? You know, and that's yeah. where the his that's where that that that's where history was made. You know, that yeah. that's where history was made, and that should have been that should have been saved. You know, it probably could have been saved for you know twenty bucks. You know, right? Yeah. Right. It's, it's right. a shame we didn't we didn't do that. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, but not a lot happened at Tinker's Barn, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Other than, you know, <laughs> Bruce was sleeping there, you know. And I think I slept there one night, and I was like, we got to get out of here. We gotta be here. <laughs> we're, we're being poisoned. This is like, this is poison. This is toxins in the air from the fucking surfboards. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I probably saved his life by getting him out of there. You know, we, we, we got an apartment together after that. But, you know. But he was staying there like regularly and like and man, you know, they're making surfboards with that crazy shit in the air, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. If what you if what you were smoking wasn't getting you high, that surfboard fumes. Oh, man. The resin, the resin. Yeah. <laughs> You'd mentioned John John Lennon before, and in the book you talk about the seeing the Beatles for the first time on Ed Sullivan and, and they were actually a band, which is what made them there was four of them. There was four guys that camaraderie doing together. Was that uh, did you did you see anybody else? Did you have any other influences when you were younger, or was that really the thing that kickstarted oh, yeah. it all? No, 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 no. It was the whole British invasion, but they but they were first, and, and yeah. I always I always connect that appearance 
with the Stones four months later on Hollywood Palace. It was right. always that yin and yang for me uh, was an extremely important combination because we didn't discover the Beatles till halfway through the career. Right? You know, they, you know, they were together like fifty-seven. You know, and and, and uh, over in sixty-nine. Right. So, you know, we, 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 we get them November 9th, 1964. And by then they were really good. I mean, they're, they're, they were perfect. Nice. The harmony was perfect. You know, the hair, the clothes. I mean, they were just like from another planet, literally. And, um, and revealed that new world, you know, to us. Mm -hmm. It was very exciting for, like I said, the freaks like, like me, <laughs> you know, who, who was not happy with the options that society was offering. You, you right. Know? Of course. All right. Um, but four months later, very importantly, the Stones come and they're wearing what they feel like by then. Mm -hmm. And they're making it look easier than it is. And the hair is not perfect except for Brian Jones. And, you know, <laughs> and, and there's no harmony at all, you know, really. And and, uh, right. and they were really the first punk band for, for real, mm -hmm. uh, you know, making it look easy. And um, and I and I have talked about this a, a lot, but but it was very important to me that you know Mick Jagger was the first guy in in show business that I'd ever seen that didn't smile, you know, and, <laughs> right. uh, and and that really struck me uh, as important because I wasn't that into the show business at the time, mm. you know, I kind of like it now, but but back then, <laughs> um, you know, you're looking for your identity, you're building your identity, and, and you are who you like, and and uh, you're taking something from this and something from that. You know, to build your your own you know your own identity, right. and that to me made a statement that this is not show business. This is a lifestyle, you know. Right. And that's what I wanted to be a part of. I wanted to be part of that lifestyle. Uh, yeah. You know. Uh, so so the Stones, uh, the way I like to put it, is is uh, the, the Beatles introduced us to a whole new world, and the Rolling Stones invited us in. Nice. I'm glad you yeah. said something nice about the Stones, by the way, too, because I feel like in the press lately they've been getting shit on for no reason by other really popular bands. Like the the dude from the Who basically called them a garage band. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm like those, those guys don't mean it. They don't mean it. They don't oh, mean okay. It. They're, they're, they're all friends. They're all friends. You know, it's uh, just for our torment, so we could talk about it. Because I was like, what the yeah. fuck is going on? No, 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 no. They don't mean that stuff. They don't mean that oh, stuff. okay. You know, they're, they're all they're all friends. Oh, that's great. Um, I ask everybody this when they come on. Do you remember your first paid gig? Like when you actually got paid to do what you love? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was at uh um I'm gonna forget the name of it now. Uh <laughs> Clearwater, Clearwater, um uh, Clearwater Pool. It was like a a pool club in Highlands mm -hmm. uh where where um oh I don't know, three, four years later there'd be a riot, you know, the famous riot of Middletown. Yeah. Where the uh where the police attacked the hippies. Right. Where we were playing with uh, one of one of uh, with Steel Mill, oh, wow. uh, one of our bands, yeah. But my that was my also my, my very first appearance was as a singer, and um, I remember was, uh, the song I did was "Like a Rolling Stone," and um, nice. Oh, wow. It was with a group called the Shadows, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I do remember. It. That's awesome. I like when people remember their first get their first bit because I I feel like everybody normally does, and if they don't, it's because they blacked it out. <laughs> like it was the worst, you know. They had a fight for the money or whatever the deal is, and they're like, you know what? No, it was just born and then success. Um, I got to touch on a little bit on your activism and stuff because I really appreciate uh, all, all that kind of stuff, and I just love to. I, I like reading about it in the book. I know you've been honored by the United Nations twice, uh, which is incredible. Um, and you did it all basically through music, you know, with uh, uh, fighting apartheid, um, you know, getting Mandela freed. Uh, what do you, do you remember the thing, the exact moment where you realized I have the ability to change, you know, the outcome of stuff and I should do it? No, I, I don't think you really, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't really, uh, feel that uh, until Mandela walked out of that prison, wow. you know, which was wow. incredible. Yeah. You know, you know, you can imagine, uh, something I never thought I'd see in my, in my lifetime, Right. Well, so, you know, you don't really. Uh, well, no, actually, uh, before that, before that, um, we did uh, have the success uh, of uh, overriding uh, the Reagan veto mm -hmm. of the economic sanctions bill. So that that right. that was a clear victory. 
uh, I must say. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and so so that was that was that was really the first time I felt like, wow, we really can we really can accomplish something. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was some victories along the way. You know, I think we 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 I think we probably stopped the the uh, invasion of Nicaragua, you know. Yeah. Um, I, you know, um, you know, I did some things, you know, in, in Haiti and, and uh, you know, there's, there's some little victories along the way where sure. you felt like you could accomplish things. Um, we stopped a big hydroelectric dam from being built that would have wiped out an ecosystem the size of like Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so along the way, uh, we had some, we, had, we did have some victories, but uh yeah, the big, the big one, you know, one, one of the big ones was uh, was overriding. You know, Reagan was just God in those days, and uh, right when he vetoed something, it, it stayed vetoed, and uh, we we overrode his veto, which was incredible, a miracle, and and you know, and done by the way with Republican votes. So right, a little, little, slightly different Republican Party back then. Yeah, a little bit voting, uh, f so black people could vote in South Africa. Right, as opposed to what they're doing now, which is stopping black people from voting in America. You know? Yeah, man, it's fucking different. wild. A little different. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Do you feel? Do you still get the? Uh, I know. I know you're still active and you still have a voice and you still do that kind of stuff. Is it frustrating seeing it kind of take a turn for like? I don't want to even say the worst. I mean, now we've got you know, uh, Biden in office and whatever, and that's great because Trump is out. But there's still so fucking much to do. Does it ever get overwhelming to you? Yeah, it's overwhelming right now. Uh, yeah. I couldn't be more frustrated than right now. I hear you. I just, you know, I just, uh, I mean, the past five, you know, five years, you know, with Trump, it was Hor yeah. you know, horrifying beyond, beyond comprehension. Mm -hmm. and now we think, you know, we, 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 you know, we got rid of the great Satan and uh, <laughs> <laughs> the real great Satan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, you know, it, the truth of the matter is, there's a war going on, and only one side's fighting it. Yep. And, and uh, it's extremely frustrating, and I and I am very, very unhappy with uh, Biden and uh, same his dozen of uh, unforced errors that he's committed. Uh, you know, and I just uh, it's really frustrating. You know, it's I, I it's, you know he's, he's like the right president at the wrong time. You know. Yep. And I'm like, you know, uh, you know, the only way you. Uh, Appoint, uh, you know, Barney Fife as your AG is if you think you're Andy Griffith, you know? right? <laughs> <laughs> living, it's in, living in Mayberry, which is yeah, weird, which is what this, which is exactly what he is. Absolutely, right? he thinks he's Andy Griffith living in Mayberry, <laughs> you know, and, and so he appoints Don Knotts as Attorney General, you know, and, and I'm like, man, are you kidding me or what? Yeah, the fucking war, man, exactly. you know, and uh. And we're losing, to say the least. Yep. We are losing. And, you know. And so they don't even think we're losing. That's the other fucking problem that drives me crazy is that they're just going to they're just going to let it happen. They're going to let it slip away. Yeah. And uh, yeah. the other thing that drives me crazy, I saw uh, Kamala Harris being interviewed the other day and they asked her um, a legitimate question about basically about like, who is president? Is it Manchin or is it Biden? You know, and she got pissed. And instead of actually addressing the question, she just listed accomplishments, which is what a Democrat seemed to do. And it's like that. Uh, great. I'm glad you got some shit done. But the stuff we put you in office for, uh, you're not doing like we, we you know, it's insane. Yeah, it's sad. Uh, the way she's been marginalized has also been sad. To yeah. Speak, you know, but I. Uh, what can you say? I mean, I, I don't I know. It, it doesn't help having. You know those two Benedict Arnold fucks <laughs> in the Democratic Party. You know, yep. fucking everything up. But I, I, you know, I, I, I have, I have called people. I, 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 I was like, you know, ten Republicans in the in the House and seven senators, seven Republican senators voted to impeach Trump. I right. said, don't tell me you can't make a deal with those people, okay? Right. Because I. Could. OK, <laughs> if I can make a deal with them, you can make a deal with them. All right. And I, I'd say, fuck Mansion and Cinema. Let's yeah. get all you need is two Republicans, you know, to, right. to, you know, and, and, and let's go get them. They're gettable. Absolutely. Right? They're, they're, they're going to be they're going to be uh, uh, primary. They're dead. They're dead men mm -hmm. walking. No yeah. way. Right? They're going to be elected again. Right. So, you know, 
either convert them, you know, convert them to Democrats or, 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 or you know, a make a deal, man. There's a deal yeah. to be made there, you know. And then, you know, a man should go back to his fucking rat hole where he belongs, this motherfucker. <laughs> I know. You know? Uh, so, you know, it was bullshit. I'm from West Virginia. I know. It's you know, such bullshit. Like, like, the, like he's a tough guy all of a sudden, you know. Right. He, like there's nobody poor in West Virginia? I mean, yeah, who exactly. Who the fuck is this fuck? <laughs> well, you know, I know. People like I was what? just in close to West Virginia. Trust me, there's a lot of people in West Virginia. Come on, so, you know he's not. He doesn't care about the people of West Virginia. He cares yeah. about the fossil fuels industry. I said, you know, people were like, "How can he be doing this?" I said, "Check his bank account. That's how he's yeah. doing it." You know? Exactly. I mean, exactly. You know, it's, 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 it's coal. It's oil. You know, it's it's all those fucking fossil fuels. You yeah, know, absolutely, man. Alive, it, you know, so. So what I'm getting from this is now that you've conquered the music industry, the acting world, I think you're going to have to take over the political arena. We see you go for president. Pretty yeah, first. I'm, I'm writing you in. <laughs> Who, can Who can afford it? I got, I got too big an overhead. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, listen, I got I got to thank you for coming on, man. It's been an absolute blast. But I got two more questions for you that we ask every guest. Can you can you stick around for uh, and ask them? Sweet. Sure, sure. One, one is um, uh, if you could go back in time talk to your younger self and give yourself a piece of advice that would help you today, what would it be? Get a manager. Okay. <laughs> okay. A good piece of advice. That is a good piece of advice. Don't, don't, you know, the, the, you, you got to understand in this world, man, content is only half the story. Okay. Yeah. Content is half the story and marketing it is the other half. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it's not really two different things. It's actually mm -hmm. two halves of the same thing, you know, yeah. and all yeah. of us, we all need an advocate. Okay. That's the Absolutely. manager's first job is an advocate. And, right. and, you know, and somebody needs to take care of the business while we're being creative. And that's just, that's just a fact of life, man. So my biggest mistake in my life was not having a manager and I tried, but I, I just, you know, this is the biggest failure of, of my life was not, not finding a manager. Wow. That's good advice though, man. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, and then the other question is what had to end in your life, good or bad, or professionally or personally, that led you that that uh led you to where you are today? Well, I mean, obviously it would have been, you know, leaving the East Street band, you know. I right. think uh um I think that was the, the turning point of my life. And like I said, I thought it was the end of my life. Mm -hmm. And in many ways it it was the end of a life of luxury and 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 you know uh being a successful a successful guy a successful businessman you know and and, and yeah who knows what i could have done with that but but um in the end i wouldn't trade it i wouldn't trade it nice. you know, I, I think you know I, I did some good things uh since i left and uh i'm hoping for a big fourth quarter yeah, <laughs> that was I my question. <laughs> like, what what comes next? I feel like there's been so much accomplishment that. Do you have your sights set on something, or are you just in the moment? And what comes to you is going to be what it is. Well, there's, yeah, there's a lot of things I, 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 you know, a lot of things I want to do. I want to, you know, I want to continue trying to. Uh, I've, I've been trying to recreate uh, an infrastructure for rock. Uh, you know, since you know the rock era ended. And we're back in a pop era now for for decades, right? Um, you know, I clocked the rock era from from like a Rolling Stone to Kurt Cobain's death, uh, and wow. and then we went back. You know, the rock era really ended, and we went back to a pop era. So I've been trying to reconstruct uh, an infrastructure that will sustain rock. I mean, you know, we're never going to be mainstream again. Okay, we're back to being a cult, which is maybe where we belong. <laughs> but I want to make sure it's a healthy cult. You know? Yeah. And so, you know, I, I spent time. That's why I, I created my radio format. That's why I, I started a record company. Um, that's why I do most 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 things the last 20 years has been to shore up and try and establish a new infrastructure. And it's really only two things away. I, I need two things, which is a, you need a TV show, which I've come very close to having um, a dozen mm -hmm. times. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, will, that will promote, you know, rock and soul. And um, I've been trying to talk like the hard rock cafes into into becoming a, a circuit, you know. There's a uh, there's yeah. uh, whatever 150 of them, 
and, you know, put in a PA, put in a stage and, you know, let, let the bands just travel from hard rock to hard rock uh, around the world, you know, so, uh, you know, something like that, some kind of, some kind of touring infrastructure, which are, they're the, they're the best set up for it. So right. I keep, keep trying to get that done. I think that's uh, a great idea. I feel like yeah. that really is. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's the main thing is, you know, that's why I, you know, my music history curriculum, I did, you know, my teachrock.org curriculum, all of that is directed towards uh, sustaining and, and making sure that, you know, rock and roll, which is an endangered species, and making sure it survives and yeah. making sure future generations have access to it, because I think it's going to be studied for hundreds of years to come. I think it's good. It's that important. And the, the Renaissance period I grew up in, you know, only happens every couple of hundred years. So you want to yeah. make stuff available and accessible. Um, and that's why I started my radio channels on Sirius Satellite and everything else. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, that, you know, just continue to do that. And, and uh, you know, I got, I got a bunch of ideas. Well, we'll see what I, what I get get around to. Yeah. I feel like it's a big community, but a small community. Actually, the guitarist from the Shazam actually said to say hello. He was on right before you. And he uh -huh. said you were going to say the other guitarist, but it was Jeremy Asbrook. <laughs> that was that, that said to say hello, and I feel like everybody, great, yeah, great, great band, yeah, 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 super. I feel like it's very, it, it's it's a small world, as big of a world as it is. Yes, yeah. and and they're out there. I mean, we, we've been on we've been on the air now twenty years, and we've introduced over a thousand new bands. A thousand, nice. wow. You know, now most of them, you know, you may not know of, but um, they're out there. You yeah, know? and yeah. and we we only play the best of the best, so nice. There's probably a yeah. hundred times, you know, uh, that out there. But, uh, you know, when there's no reward for, for being in a rock and roll band anymore, right? people are still doing it, you know, you want to support them even more. You know, you, you just want to, you just want to, yep. you know, because they're doing it out of pure passion at this point. And, uh, and that's it's so wonderful. And, and we, you know, so I keep trying to build an infrastructure that, that'll support them. And we'll see, we'll see how, how much we get done. Yeah, I think that's what will create the great art, right? Like it, just like a comedian, like you're not doing it for the daily paycheck. You're doing mm -hmm. it to to put out your art. And sure. then so, yeah. comedians don't have a Stevie Van Zandt. We we had nobody supporting us. <laughs> <laughs> I need some everything you just said in my head. I'm going. We have fucking nobody. <laughs> you know, Seinfeld's fucking driving around rich people in cars all day long. I got fucking nothing. <laughs> Uh, I'm a little. I think I might pick up a guitar now, just so I can get into the the, the fold. Um, yeah, the, the, you know it, I like it, is, is there comedy clubs in every town still? Every town? No, no. I mean, yeah. in Jersey, there's like two that are decent, and then. Uh, but you know, I, I, whenever I go out on the road, I like. You know, there's there's definitely places where like uh, obviously New York, Boston, DC, I love. But when I go out on the road, even like Midwest and stuff, I do like finding small towns with comedy clubs. Cause they're, they're super excited. It's the only thing to do, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and that's a lot of fun for me. I, I like doing that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, but not as many as there used to be. Yeah. That's a shame. Cause it I, it's, it, 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 well, you know, the same thing for, for rock when it comes to the, cl the club scene. I mean, you know, right. Uh, I, I like going places where nobody goes, you know, I like, I like going down Damn. South and, you know, my agent's always like, you don't want to go down South. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. And I'm like, you know, I want to play Alabama. I don't care. Yeah. You know, and, I, and, and I do. And, and, and you know, and yes, it's it's less people. But so what? You right. know, they're, they're, they're three times as enthusiastic. Absolutely, you know? man. Yeah. I love small rooms, low ceilings. You know, uh, it's great. Yeah, man. You know, it's just like, you know. But I think so. I, I you know, I think comedy plays an important role in the. You know, it's it's not just uh, escapist entertainment. Most of right. the great comedians have some insights, and absolutely, you know, you know that's what makes it that's what makes it uh, important. That, that makes yeah. it the art the art form that it is. You know, so the, the more we can get around the country, the better. You know, absolutely, man. I completely agree. I, and by the way, I don't even know if you realize that you're doing this, but what you had said before about uh, not having a manager and somebody in your corner, you know how important it is what you're doing for rock and roll, you are in these people's corners. You're there. You know what I mean? You're not necessarily their manager, but you're taking that step a little further and being that person who has their back. And I don't even, I mean, do you realize, like, does that? No, no. Yeah. We, we mix it up. I mean, we started off the record company uh, as being management. Mm -hmm. also. Um, but then we just, we just, it, it became too much. So we just, we just a record company. Now. Right. But um, we help them out. It's just like, yeah. We just but, like we are their managers anyway. You know what I mean? We're, exactly. We help them get gigs. You know, we help 
promotion and marketing. You know, we'll, whatever we can do, yeah, uh, we try and do, yeah. And so that's important because before yeah. I had a manager, I mean, I had guys that looked out, like took me under their wing, looked out for me. Joe Starr is a good friend of mine and one of them, and he, and he, uh, you know, did the same thing. So it was, just, it's always nice to know that there's somebody standing behind you, cheering you on. And also somebody that did it. Like you're one of the people that did it. You're not a yeah. manager trying to be predatorial on them. Like you're leading by example. Like you mm -hmm. went from small town to big stage. And now they see that, you know, it's yeah. feasible. Well, that's the thing, you know, and, 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 and at least in my business, uh, the, the hardest thing in the world to find is a manager because um, unlike agents, you know, <laughs> often the managers, you know, at first, you know, they got to they got to give up some money you know they they can't yeah. they can't yeah. you know just be charging their 10 10 percent 20 percent whatever it is uh you know you gotta you gotta let the money flow through to keep the band alive you know yep. and uh, you know very often costs you money it costs absolutely you money. so you know that that's uh tough it's tough for a manager to make that commitment uh usually and um uh, but it's necessary absolutely necessary if you go through the history of rock and roll and look at who made it and who didn't I guarantee you it's it's a management every right. time, every time. Yeah. Um, and well, listen, man, I don't want to keep you any longer because I know you got to go. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, had a blast talking My to you. Pleasure. My pleasure. Really. Yeah. Pleasure. It was awesome meeting you, man. It was so great. Um, and guys, pick up his book of Unrequited Infatuations. Amazing. Uh, Perfect Christmas gift. Absolutely. It's I'm throwing now. that out there for everybody that knows me. Perfect Christmas <laughs> gift. I want to see it underneath this tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great man thank you so much dude i really appreciate it all right Thanks man. so much man such a pleasure Bye -bye. all right dystopia tonight